from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. Coming up on Ag Day, the tough talk on trade ramps up. People can't charge us 270% and we charge them nothing. That doesn't work anymore. Canada's dairy program takes a direct hit. Plus, the Senate preparing to mark up its version of the Farm Bill. In agribusiness, checking the charts. You know, with the growing season still ahead of us, I'd like to think that we can maintain some kind of risk premium in the market. And the brain benefits of being a social butterfly in Ag for Your Health. Ag Day, brought to you by the Chevy Silverado, the most dependable, longest-lasting, full-size pickups on the road. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. The president taking strong words and tough talk to the G7 summit of the world's largest economies in Canada over the weekend. President Trump delivering a stern warning on trade to foreign countries at the Group of Seven summit on Saturday, urging trading partners not to retaliate against U.S. tariffs on the imports of steel and aluminum. Trump telling reporters he pressed for fair and reciprocal trade urging his foreign counterparts to eliminate all tariffs, trade barriers, and subsidies in their trading practices. Now, the president focusing squarely on Canada's dairy restrictions and that 270% tariff on U.S. products entering Canada during his comments. Ultimately, that's what you want. You want a tariff-free, you want no barriers, and you want no subsidies because you have some cases where countries are subsidizing industries, and that's not fair. An example where we're paying, the United States has paying 270 percent. You just can't have it. And when they send things into us, uh, you don't have that. I will say it was not contentious. What was strong was the language that this cannot go on. Economists say there are some merits for agriculture if tariffs and barriers are eliminated. Canada, for example, essentially prohibits the importation of U.S. dairy and, and poultry. Uh, Europe uh, makes it almost impossible to export uh, just about anything to Europe except uh, corn and, and soybeans. So the removal of duties uh, worldwide would have an enormously positive impact on U.S. agricultural exports, but I cannot give you a precise number. Hay says it's important to note when some countries remove duties, they put other barriers in place, such as not importing hogs with rectopamine or limiting certain GM grains. It's another big week for the Farm Bill. The Senate Farm Bill markup session is set for Wednesday in the Senate Ag Committee, while House GOP leaders continue to seek a compromise on immigration reform. Freedom Caucus members are still demanding an immigration vote as a condition for their support of the House version of the Farm Bill. The Senate proposal protects and strengthens crop insurance, improving ARC county yield calculations. It includes a million new acres in the Conservation Reserve Program, enhanced export and trade programs, expanded high-speed internet, and new opioid treatment and prevention efforts. Now, it also has permanent funding for beginning farmer and rancher programs. There are no new food stamp work requirements in that bill. The Senate Ag Committee is set to mark up its version of the Farm Bill tomorrow. Livestock groups are lobbying for a foot and mouth disease vaccine bank, something that has never been in previous farm bills. Betsy Chivin has a report on what the Senate's draft has to offer on FMD. Soon farm country will find out if the Senate's draft of the Farm Bill will make it through markup and receive approval with the Ag Committee. We've worked together in the past to produce a bipartisan bill and that's what we're trying to do. Livestock producers are looking for new verbiage yet to be printed in a farm bill. Funding an acknowledgement for a foot and mouth disease vaccine bank, which has the ability to affect animals such as cattle, pigs and sheep. It's a disease which has not hit the United States since 1929. In the event of an outbreak, our export markets would shut down immediately and all of a sudden we would have you know, 26 percent too much pork on the domestic market. The Senate version does include $30 million for the National Animal Health Laboratory Network to be used for biosecurity and diagnostics. However, the Senate bill only calls for the establishment of FMD vaccines. Funding and creation of the program is left up to the Ag Secretary. We start it and then we can't keep it up. That's what was one of the issues that came about with the, with the Senate or the House bill. Can we keep it up if we don't have funding every year? National Pork Producers Council is advocating for $150 million in funding annually for a vaccine bank. We're hopeful that we're going to be able to continue to work with the Senate and the House Ag Committees in order to, to get to a spot where we're able to adequately prepare ourselves for an FMD outbreak. Continuing on with a mission to be ready if an outbreak were to occur. 
Reporting for Ag Day, I'm Betsy Gibbon. All right, thanks, Betsy. The House's version of the Farm Bill allocated funding of $150 million for one full year. Years two through five offered decreased funding. House Act Chairman Mike Conaway saying the House's version had no new money and used what they could. USDA releasing its latest crop progress report Monday. The report shows a strong start to the corn crop. 77% is rated good to excellent overall, and most of the states in the Midwest can boast even higher numbers. Though it was late getting in, 90% of Minnesota's corn is called good to excellent. It's 91% Wisconsin, 87% in Ohio, 86% Nebraska. The lowest in the corn belt is Indiana, but it's still an enviable 75% good to excellent. Now, soybeans are nearly all planted with 93% in the ground, eight points ahead of average, 83% has emerged well ahead of average, and 74% is called good to excellent overall. Many of the Midwest states have soybean conditions in the upper 80s. And winter wheat harvest reaching 14% harvested, a couple points ahead of average. Texas wheat reached 58% cut, 18 points ahead. Oklahoma's at the halfway point, 20 points better than average. And Kansas wheat harvest just now getting underway. Mike Hoffman in the studio today he joins us now to look at some more crop comments. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Clinton. Let's start off at the tip of Texas. Colin Chapellis sending us this picture of sorghum harvest rolling right along. Colin says yields are not good, though. He's received only three tenths of an inch of rain in 75 days. And Matt in Oconto, Nebraska, says he's moving the cattle on a rotational grazing system. He says the pastures are green and lush. The U.S. Drought Monitor says 18% of the state is only abnormally dry. And taking a look at the uh, wind speed forecast, you can see the uh, areas of wind. There's a few pockets where it's going to be fairly windy to start today, but as we head through the rest of the day, it's going to be the northern plains, northern New England, and south Texas to get a little bit breezy. Heading into the day tomorrow, not too much to start, but as you can see as we head through the day, then central plains over into the Great Lakes turn a little bit on the windy side. We'll check the rest of your forecast coming up, but first here are some hometown temps. Your next piece of equipment is on MachineryPete.com. Search equipment from dealerships across the country to find what you're looking for. Only on MachineryPete.com. When we come back, we'll get a technical read of the charts. Brian Split is at the Agribusiness Desk, and we dig deeper into those dairy tariffs that's shaking up G7 talks. Plus, with the average age of American farmers rising, it's important to remain mentally sharp. We'll have some advice in Ag for Your Health. Ag Day, brought to you by Top Third Ag Marketing. Farmer first with a plan for every market. An agribusiness rain over the weekend, leading to a soft start for grains Monday. Details now from the floor this evening in Chicago. Today's soybeans were down yet again. It seems the weather, good weather, and the geopolitics have really sunk the, the futures a lot. There has been nice tense, uh, temps, uh, plenty of rain, uh, really getting the crops off to a good start. Uh, that's certainly going to pressure some of the market. Non-commercial uh, longs in the market, both, both in soybeans and in corn, uh, are starting to liquidate a little bit because the market has come down so hard. We're seeing a new low now for 2018 in the soybean uh, market, and that has a lot of traders a little bit worried. Corn also was lower. Good weather, geopolitics again playing another role uh, with both, both soybeans and corn. These political tensions are really starting to heat up, and they're worrying a lot of traders, and I think that a little bit of the liquidation might be uh, a premature, uh, but everyone wants to get to the side because they're not sure exactly what's happening. Uh, that just is going to lend itself to a lot more volatility to come. Wheat also was down. The world wheat uh, uh, production is still a factor all the way across the board. That's all from the floor at the CME Group here in Chicago. I'm Virginia McGaffey. Brian Split with Allendale Incorporated, our guest here at the Agribusiness Desk today. Brian, let's, uh, let's talk about kind of some of the movement that we've seen in these markets over the last few weeks. We've got fundamentals, weather a big part of that right now. Planning was a big part of that conversation. What about the charts? What are they showing us technically? Uh, right now, the November soybean contract is interacting with a lot of the major lows that we had when we had the early April trade war overnight aggressive sell-off. Right. Uh, we've actually taken those levels out. Uh, the nearby July contract is not very far away from the lows made for the year early in the year in January. So uh, these are definitely levels that we'd want to see hold. Uh, otherwise, we could see more of a, a, a 
liquidation event occur if these levels are, are breached. Um, so, you know, with the growing season still ahead of us, I'd like to think that we can maintain some kind of risk premium in the market. Uh, you know, for the corn market right now, we've got a, a double top on December corn. Uh, we had a high that was made in July of, of uh, 2017 on this contract at 429 and a half. Mm -hmm. Made the secondary high at 429 and a half just recently going into Memorial Day weekend. So uh, that's a major resistance level that's been established and, and uh, quite often a topping pattern. Um, we are now also interacting with the lows that we had, uh, not only from the uh, trade war sell-off uh, in, in early April, but also those lows that we had made prior to the uh, planting intention and quarterly stock report at the sure. end of March. So again, levels that we want to see hold. And I would advise that uh, producers keep a very close eye on the gap that we left this week at 411 basis December futures. And uh, we were talking that 411 with a, a 25 cent roll to the July of 19 still gives you a, you know, 436 uh, futures for, for July. And, you know, if you can get a 35 yeah. cent basis, you're still at $4 cash. So. Right, right. Uh, so as you look at what's happening and you're watching these charts and they're giving you some pretty good indicators and things to really kind of to make decisions off of, what are you thinking that we need to be, I don't know, preparing ourselves for as we go through this summer? Well, right now it seems like it, 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 with the technicals in mind that we have seen highs. Okay. Um, and so to me that means that we're back into a sell the rally type of a market and I'm not going to suggest that we're just going to go straight down at this point. I don't think sure. that's uh, very likely and, and we have a lot of growing season ahead of us but um, you know with the levels that we've seen fail over and over in November soybeans at 1060 uh, I think you have to be mindful of, of levels in between ten dollars and 1060 that seem like likely levels that uh, you'd want to make sales although I do think producers have, have been pretty aggressive on soybeans uh, we've been talking about selling beans as an industry for the right. last six months. Um, and then on corn, I think, you know, you have to make uh, some commitments at some higher levels and, and look for the support to hold, so. All right, appreciate it, Brian. Good advice, we'll be back with more acne. Just a minute. To talk to Brian Split one-on-one, -on -one, call Allendale Incorporated at 800-551-4626 or email him at bsplit at allendale-inc.com. Welcome back to Ag Day, meteorologist Mike Hoffman. Mike, if we look at the map, not too much, too many dynamics out there today. Nothing big going on, but there can always be a big thunderstorm along the cold front or warm front, and that's what we'll be watching. And we'll also uh, kind of be watching the stationary front down along the off coast. There'll be some afternoon showers and thunderstorms bubble up along that. Let's put the maps into motion. You can see there's a warm front moving through the Ohio Valley into the southwestern Great Lakes. There'll be a few showers and thunderstorms along that front. Uh, then, then the uh, cold front moves on southward and uh, you'll notice uh, some showers and thunderstorms then uh, develop as we head uh, even into uh, tomorrow morning for parts of the eastern Ohio Valley, central Great Lakes. And the stationary front could actually give some places that are really dry now a little bit of moisture. You can see our model showing uh, a couple of uh, thunderstorms there developing in the panhandle of Texas and on over into uh, eastern Oklahoma. Central, southern uh, Mississippi Valley and much of the southeast and the northeast as we head through the afternoon hours tomorrow. We also have a system coming in in the Pacific Northwest, but at least uh, over the past 24 hours it's been dry. Adding in the next 36 hours, you can see some of those same places that uh, have had showers and thunderstorms will get some more. But you'll notice there's nothing huge widespread, but there's pockets where you end up with two or three inches of rain in some of these heavier thunderstorms. Now checking out temperatures, obviously it's hot in the southwest. Let's look at Phoenix, 105 expected, 90s all the way up into Kansas, so that's some heat. Comfortable in the northeast, comfortable in the northern Rockies. Uh, low temperatures tonight going to be uh, pleasant across the northern tier of states, but uh, from central Illinois southward, it's kind of on the muggy side, lows only in the 70s. Some 80s showing up in the desert southwest, and it stays <clears throat> hot for the day tomorrow in the southwest. Not quite as much heat in the central plains tomorrow, though, with that front kind of slipping slightly southward. There's the jet stream as we uh, head through time. What you'll notice is this trough kind of digs through the Great Lakes in the northeast, then a ridge builds up for a few days as the cutoff kind of goes into the southwest and that ridge gets cut down as well. So basically it's very hot in the southeast and southern plains and it continues and it warms up for several days even into the northern plains and the Great Lakes before cooling back down. That's a look across the country. Now let's take a look at some local forecasts. 
First of all, Pocatello, Idaho today, sunny, becoming milder, high of 78 degrees. Muskogee, Oklahoma, partly sunny, warm and humid with a high of 90. And Mansfield, Ohio, warm with a shower or thunderstorm likely, high around 79. We'll dig into dairy next in our dairy report, plus tips on how to keep mentally sharp on the farm or any place else. We had extremely productive discussions on the need to have fair and reciprocal, meaning the same. People can't charge us 270 percent, and we charge them nothing. That doesn't work anymore. As we report at the top of the show, President Trump singling out Canada's dairy supply management system as one of the reasons he implemented tariffs on Canadian steel and aluminum shipped into the U.S. Our partners over at Farm Journal Milk are taking a closer look at President Trump's statement about a 270 percent tariff levied by the Canadians. U.S. milk that's shipped to Canada in a quantity that is within the amount specified within the North American Free Trade Agreement does not face duties, but it's U.S. milk exports to Canada beyond the agreed upon levels that face a surplus quota of 241 percent. Now, according to Farm Journal, milk over surplus duties also exist for other dairy products, including blended dairy powder at 270 percent. You can learn more about the dairy tariff at milkbusiness.com. As the Senate prepares to mark up a farm bill tomorrow, the dairy industry could be seeing a big benefit from the margin protection program. The Senate version, renamed Dairy Risk Coverage, discounts premiums based on production history for farms shipping less than 2 million pounds annually. The DRC premium, premiums would be discounted 50%. It would discount production history from 2 to 10 million by 25%. The Senate bill ultimately providing an additional $100 million into the dairy program. Do you find yourself forgetting where you left your keys or where you parked your truck? Well, one way to preserve memory as we get older, maybe making more friends. Details next in Ag for Your Health. In the Country, brought to you by Kubota. Learn more about Kubota SSV Series skid steers at Kubota.com or demo one at your local Kubota dealer today. USDA NAS is wrapping up the collection of data for the 2017 Census of Agriculture. Some farmers are opposed to sharing that personal data. Well, USDA Census is conducted every five years. The deadline to submit your paper questionnaire is this Friday. Farmers and ranchers can also respond online. That deadline is the end of July. Now, the last Ag Census was conducted back in 2012. One of the statistics showed the average age of U.S. farmers was rising. The average age of the principal farm operator, 58 years old, one full year older than the average age discovered back in the 2007 census. Now, as we age, memory loss becomes more prevalent, but there are things you can do to protect brain health. In this video provided by the Ohio State Wexner Medical Center, Barb Consiglio tells us how being social is key to keeping a sharp mind after retirement. After 30 years as an attorney, Dan Mertz is ready for retirement. I'm down to five work days left and um, putting away all the old memories. Dan's looking forward to having time to reconnect with friends and family. And while maintaining a strong social circle correlates to better memory and cognitive function as we age, experts at the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center set out to discover why. Trying to figure out whether or not those social ties are actually causing changes in cognition was what I was aiming to do with this study. To do that, Elizabeth Kirby and her team studied groups of mice, some in groups of two and some with a few more roommates and plenty of social interaction. All the mice were what researchers describe as post-retirement age, when brain function typically starts to decline. Researchers tested their memory using this maze. Only one of the holes leads to an escape hatch. And while the coupled mice searched every hole until they found the escape route, something researchers call a serial search, the mice that had more social ties seemed to use memory to improve over time and head directly to the escape route, a spatial search tactic. Kirby says the human equivalent would be like looking for your car in a large parking lot. A serial search would be to just be walking up and down every single aisle until you stumbled upon your car. 
A spatial search would be trying to remember where your car was and navigate directly to your car. In addition to outperforming the couple mice in tests, the social mice also had benefits that could be seen in their brains. The mice who had more friends who lived in a larger group had less inflammation in their brain. So a sign that's a sign of a healthier brain and aging. And while Dan is enjoying his own social network in retirement, he says the benefits to his brain are an added bonus. It's just like any other form of health. If you ignore it, it will deteriorate, and if it does, you're going to have to deal with the, the, the penalty of, of not taking care of it. At Ohio State Wexner Medical Center, this is Barb Consiglio reporting. That's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. Spend part of your day with us. From all of us here at Agda, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day.